on uh, staff here at New Brewer Cultural Center, Assistant Director of uh, Program Development and Advancement. I want to welcome you to the Brewer Cultural Center as it presents the Black History Month kickoff here. The national theme for 2019 is Black Migrations. Uh, we have our keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Jason Nichols, and uh, some of the special support that we receive from different organizations on campus include, as you can see on your folder there, the BSU, ASA, CSA, NAACP, SOUL, which is Sisterhood of Unity and Love, BMI, Black Male Initiative, the uh, National Council of Negro Women, the National Panhellenic Council, and WIDA. We're empowered to achieve the impossible next generation. So I want to say thank you very much to those groups that have supported this kickoff in addition to the Rural Cultural Center. If you open up your program, you can see on the front cover there, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, founder of Black History Month. So we'll kind of go over that a little bit later on. But without further ado, we'd like to kick things off with our uh, Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and we'll ask uh, Ms. Tiffany Blossom to come on up and lead us in this endeavor. Ziegler, who's the director of the Broadway Cultural Center, who will provide the welcome and acknowledgments. So everyone, a round of applause for Dr. Ziegler. Thank you, Andre. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our annual Black History Month kickoff. It's my distinct honor to welcome all of you, our faculty and staff uh, who are here today, our students, our Nabooa Cultural Center staff. I'd like to uh, especially acknowledge uh, Ms. Ann Carswell and the entire Nabooa Cultural Center staff, consisting of all of our staff, Mr. Salvin Kamajan, uh, Ms. Tiffany Blossom, uh, Ms. Uh, Aaron Redden and Grew, um, and all of our students uh, who are here today uh, in terms of our program. So, Black History Month is celebrated at the Rural Culture Center throughout the entire year. We're here today 
to pay tribute to those individuals who made Black History Month. And also, each one of you are making Black History at the University of Maryland as you pursue your uh, degree here at the University of Maryland. Before uh, saying much more, I'd like to uh, have our faculty or staff who've taken time or any parents who might be here, uh, any visitors to please stand to be acknowledged, if you don't mind. That includes the musicians as well. And also our uh, student ambassadors, our Nabooru crew, or standing, some of them are standing in the back. Uh, anyone else, would you please, would you please stand? If not, let's give a warm round of applause. Thank you. So today's program, in addition to our uh, Crosswell and the staff and the students who've uh, done a lot to prepare, we'd like to, I'd like to especially thank uh, Dr. Jason Nichols for uh, coming this afternoon to share his wisdom uh, with you. I've known uh, Dr. Jason Nichols for a period of time. Uh, back in the day, we used to, in addition to uh, being academicians, play a little basketball. He's a little younger than me, and uh, he's, he's pretty good. But we won't tell you the outcome of the games we used to play. But, uh, Dr. Nichols is a is a scholar and an athlete, and we thank you, Dr. Nichols, for coming here this afternoon. So again, uh, I'd like to thank you as we begin our program and our various tributes and uh, the various idioms that I mentioned, song, dance, word, and songs, uh, to enjoy today's program and make this a month in which you will learn a lot, study harder, study harder and excel at the University of Maryland. Thank you. One last thing, I forgot to acknowledge and make a personal note of Mr. Andre Nottingham. I know he's been acknowledged, but let's give him a warm round of welcome. All right, next up with the history of Black History Month, Mr. Henry Uzer who's a Nibiru student assistant and ambassador. So without further ado, give us a warm, a warm round of applause. Good evening. Good evening. Just like Mr. Nottingham said, my name is Henry Uzor. I'm a student ambassador here at Edinburgh. And today I'll be reading an excerpt on the background of Black History Month. Black History Month is celebrated every year in February. Initially it was called Negro History Month, or Negro History Week, and was celebrated for just one week in February until 1926. Carter Goodwin Woodson extended the celebrations for the full month of February in the year 1976 to commemorate America's bicentennial celebration. He is therefore called the founder of Black History Month. Carter decided to nominate February over other months because the two famous Americans, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, were born in February. He thought it would be fitting to tribute to the blacks who toiled tirelessly to contribute their values and ideals to American culture and society. Woodson studied African American history for several years. He also wrote numerous books and published various journals like The Education of the Negro Prior in 1861, The History of the Negro Church, The Negro and Our History, and A Century of Negro Migration. He was also the founder of the Journal of Negro History and published the first article in 1916. In 2002, the journal was renamed the Journal of African American History and is published even today. Here, we therefore decided to celebrate an entire month 
to honor and acknowledge their contribution in molding America's society, culture, and geography. Until his retirement, he worked at Howard University to highlight the contribution of blacks to the American society. Thank you, everyone. tribute and song with Sister Pat and one vibe. So uh, stay tuned, get ready. Give a round of applause, My name is Sister Pat, and our band is called Sister Pat's One Vibe, because we're all one tribe. No matter your race, queen of color, every man is our brother. You know, I'm not from here, I'm from Guyana, South America. We have Ronnie Hinton, who happened to be, if y'all look back in the music history books, or even go to the, uh, black, the African American Museum, you'll see singers like Wilson Pickett. Well, we had the privilege of having his guitarist, the late Wilson Pickett's guitarist. Ronnie Hinton on the guitar. Tony Heron on the bass. And don't say girls don't have rhythm. We got Miss Denise Johnson on the bass. In two days, in two days, it's going to be the birthday of someone that's very special to me, to all of us, no matter your race, creed, or color, free at last. Let me know if, if, if this makes sense to you. Thank you. 
here at the University of Maryland College Park campus. Ms. Carswell had uh, identified a couple of students at one of the previous events and uh, want to bring them to your attention this evening. So a tribute and dance, Mr. Elion Trotman, who's a sophomore here at the University of Maryland. Good evening, everyone. Can I go 
everyone hear me okay? All right, I'm Bella Simon, and I will be doing an original poem entitled, Don't Get Comfortable Watching. As a young girl, I watched a white man get out of his car and spit at my mom through her window. And even as young as I was, I got out of the car, chest extended, and flaunted my height as a scare tactic, given that I reached 5'11 by third grade, 6 foot by seventh grade, and 6'3 in present day. As a sophomore in high school, I watched my teacher recommend all of the white kids in class for AP, even if they had a C, while she recommended me to go down a level, and they got their notes from me. Despite not having any support from my teacher, I fought to get into AP because I realized that if I wanted something done, I had to do it myself. As a black female, I watched another get ridiculed by a white student for living in what they call the projects. And I stood in and I educated this boy on how the term projects derives from a white man or shipping black families to a certain area where the rent is too high for others but considerably low for them, so they call it help from the government. But they throw drugs in the mix to see how far blacks are willing to go to get cash, so it becomes exactly that, a project. You see, whether fighting for myself or defending others, I've never sat back and watched as others were ridiculed ostracized or excluded in any way. However, sadly, that has drastically changed today, and I'm sad to say that I've done nothing but watch recently. Watch as white supremacists get bold enough to start coming out of their hiding places to inflict havoc on our young boys and girls. Watch as immigrants are mistreated, caged, and reminded that following the American dream can ever only be just a dream. Watch as everyone tells the so-called president not to have the government shut down while they should be telling him to shut up. Watch as our young black boys and girls are brutally and unapologetically gunned down in the streets for buying Skittles, selling CDs, or for simply walking. Watch as people misuse the term immigrant based solely upon whether or not they come from a Latino country. And watch as the president further divides states that were supposed to be united. Well, I'm done watching. I'm done having my need to defend and fight for others be an act that has been forgotten. I realize that I have to stop watching for the sake of watching and start watching for the sake of doing. I have to remind everyone that Bird Box wasn't just a movie because we really are blindfolded. Mm. Blindfolded to all the relevant issues in the world that do not affect you and me. I have to encourage others to want to take their blindfolds off in a hope to want to see. Let's stop watching the world go around, happen around us and start taking action. I encourage you to turn your TV onto something other than power or Grey's Anatomy to make a real difference in others' lives. And I encourage you to speak up and speak out when you realize that something isn't right. You see, I finally realized that this country is riddled and sick with countless issues and that we could be the cure. So now I ask, I know my plan. What's yours? Thank you. All right, all this talent coming from the juke joint. Another round of applause, please. Back again, a tribute in song, Sister Pat and One Guy will entertain us again. Yeah, uh, yeah, no. Thank you, Nob. Let Nob uh, up in the sound room. The sound guys never get any credit. Come on, give a, a whole lot of By the way, that first song that I did, who, the, the man who composed it, that would have been 74 years old on February 6th. Could anybody guess who wrote that? No, what's up? Uh, 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 anybody guess who that composed what? Bob? Hello. Yeah, man. Rabbi Nesta Marley. But this now, this song. Uh, it was uh, written by a lady who was a, a civil rights activist, blues singer, jazz singer. She did everything, she, but she lived in France. A lot of our people moved to France when they were blacklisted here. I'm not going to tell you. Look it up. So this is in tribute to Miss Nina Simone.
Jason Nichols is a full-time lecturer in, African American, in the African American Studies Department right here on campus. Um, he and, and other scholars like Dr. Joseph Richardson and, and so many others over in that department are doing some powerful, powerful work. And please don't believe the, believe the hype. Um, you know, a lot of people say that you can't do anything with a degree in African American Studies. You can do virtually anything you want with a degree in African American Studies. Big time. All right. And that, and that it, it needs our support. We don't support the African American Studies Department on this campus and other places. It may not exist, you know, within a decade. So we really need to support, you know, this department. Um, as I said before, he's the long, he was the longtime editor-in-chief of uh, Words, Beats, and Life, the global journal of hip-hop culture, the first peer-reviewed journal on hip-hop studies. He also co-edited La Verdad, an international dialogue on hip-hop Latinidades, which was published by Ohio State University Press, major, major, major research one institution. And so, you know, being, you know, published by Ohio State Press is a very, very, very big deal. Dr. Nichols' work has been featured in publications such as The Guardian, Al Jazeera, uh, MSNBC News, The Hill, Independent uh, Journal Review, The Afro, uh, the, Black, uh, the, the Baltimore Sun, and he's also, as I said before, he's appeared on the air on MSNBC, Fox News, and many, many, many other radio and television programs. Um, and so I want all of you to give a very black-tastic, <laughs> warm, warm African Mburu welcome, welcome, uh, and round of applause for the Dr. Jason Nichols. <laughs> How's everybody 
y'all doing tonight? That's good, that's good. I'm glad everybody is uh, feeling good. I wanted to, uh, first of all, give a shout out to Dr. Z. Uh, we definitely did play basketball together. <laughs> Do not let this man fool you. <laughs> He is one of those guys, he, he may look 45, but his knees are 23. Oh, and, uh, so he, fouls. he will definitely, he still has those old man tricks, you know, the little, the little elbow to the, to the ribs and going to the hole. So this man can definitely play the game. And uh, definitely uh, Solomon as well and, and Miss Carswell uh, have been big supporters of, of us over in African American Studies. We are so grateful that we have the support of Nibiru and that we can continue to have uh, you know, this kind of relationship together so that we can serve you and, and serve the student body. So before I begin, I want to give uh, a round of applause for the entire Nibiru uh, faculty and staff. So can we do that? And, you know, one of the things that I love, I always say this when I come to black events, is that I just love the blackness of it. You know what I mean? I love being here. I love the sister's poem. You know, I, I had to look her up and down. She said she was 6'3". I was like, I didn't believe it, but I think she's a legit 6'3". And to the band, that's been wonderful. You know, um, sis, Sister Betty? Sister Pat, Sister Pat, Sister Pat, sorry, Sister Betty is in my mind right now. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about black history today. And, and one of the things that, you know, I, I want to kind of get across is a lot of times when we talk about Black History Month, I think Dr. Ziegler made a really important point. And, and I, I'm not going to make this speech too long. I know you want to eat. But those of you who have been in my classes know I always say I'm not going to make this too long. And then... It ends up being, you know, <laughs> five minutes past the end of class. But I'm going to do my best here. Now, one of the things we do a lot of times with Black History Month, and I think Dr. Ziegler made a really important point earlier, and that is, in an ideal world, there would be no need for a Black History Month. I'm going to repeat that one more time. In an ideal world, there would be no need for a Black History Month. Black people are not... Bears. We don't hibernate for 11 months out of, the, out of the year, wake up in February. We make history every day of every month in this country and outside of it. So it's important for us to remember that. Now, the other thing is a lot of times we get very, you know, sometimes I feel like with Black History Month, and I'm going to keep it real with you, we're going we're gonna to keep it real right now. Sometimes it gets a little bit classist. We talk about you know, great, great black people, you know, the Dr. Charles Grooves and the, and the Dr. Kings and, and other people who have done incredible things in science and, and, you know, have degrees. I want you all to do your own family genealogy. And you will find black history there. Within your own family, you will find what I found in my history. And that is people who were sharecroppers, who stood up and got better working conditions or better pay, you know, for other people around them. People who were lay ministers, people who did things. And I'll tell you, my, my hero, if you follow me on social media, you know a lot of times, you know, I'll talk about my Auntie Lane. And that was because to me, she was just my aunt. And I loved her so much. And I'm going to try not to get emotional because whenever I talk about her, I get emotional. Because she was the one person, you know, who truly said to me that she saw something special in me. And we all have that person who really believes that we have something special. And when she died, I was, I was really hurt. But when I was at her funeral and people spoke about her, and they spoke about what she had done for the community, and I actually read her obituary. I saw Arnie Lane was black history. She was president of the Talbot County NAACP. She fought for students over and over again during her, her career as a teacher, particularly black students, when they were being mistreated. That's black history. So I don't want us to think that we just have to look at, you know, you should look in history books, but also do your own research about your own families, and you will find black history that doesn't get celebrated. 
And the one thing that we need to do to get past that classism is to celebrate everyday people. So one of the things you know, that I want to talk about today are some of my heroes, and I know some of it is going to surprise some of you. I'm going to give you a couple of names. Well, one of the names uh, is Marsha P. Johnson. And her friend, also a black woman, Sylvia Rivera. Now, how many people know who those names are? Oh, that's nice. That's a good, that's a good number of people there. So I'm glad that you guys know that because one of the things that we need to recognize as a people, first of all, we are global people. That is what we are. I love that Sister Pat came out and said she is from Guyana and did the little accent and everything. <laughs> South America, you know. She did the whole accent. She's our sister. And that's what was so important about her title right there where she said, I am your sister. Didn't matter that she's from South America. Doesn't matter if you're from Nigeria. It doesn't matter if you are from down the street Maryland. We are all brothers and sisters. And that's what Pan-Africanism is all about. And so Marsha P. Johnson, we talk a lot of times about Dr. King and Malcolm. And sometimes we just throw a few women's names in there as if women weren't the force behind every social movement that black people have ever had in this country. Past and present and probably future. No, that's all right, you, you can clap. I'm trying to take y'all to church up there. Y'all just sitting there looking at me like I'm crazy, like I'm saying something crazy up here. It's all right, you can respond. And now Mar Marsha P. Johnson and, and Sylvia Rivera, you know, we're, we're two black trans women. And if you don't believe that all black lives matter, then you are not pro-black. I get really annoyed when I hear a lot of black people out there who go around talking about black lives matter, but they only think about black men or black boys. Maybe occasionally black women if they die under the circumstances that they want. And they don't think about black people when they're living a lot of the times. And they think that they can exclude some black people like black LGBT people and other, you know, uh, black people who are marginalized. Am I running out of time on it? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I was just getting started. You <laughs> scared me there. But one of the key messages that I want to get across to you and mention in Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera is make your pain your promise. I'm going to repeat that. Make your pain your promise. Repeat that with me. Make your pain your promise. Now, what I mean by that is the reason that you have an African-American studies department, the reason you have an Aburu Cultural Center, is because black students at the University of Maryland felt the, plain, the pain of being excluded and their history being excluded from the curriculum here in higher education. Many of the people who fought for those departments were never going to reap the benefits of seeing them realized. But they made their pain, their promise to you, even though they don't know who you are. And this is exactly why you have to carry on that legacy. That is our legacy. So I'm going to tell you a quick story also about my own family. My Uncle Charlie, he lived to be 108 years old. And I, I'll tell you, was a World War II veteran, died on Memorial Day. And I'll tell you a, a story about him. Just a quick side story. You know, one time my family was having an event. He was probably 85 at this point, so he was still a young man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everybody was eating, and it was, you know, like the meal y'all are going to eat a heavy meal, you know, with the macaroni and cheese and the, and the cornbread with little pieces of corn in it. And not, not the box stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, that real stuff. You know? And. Uncle Charlie just brought up a, a small bowl of black olives. And somebody asked him after a while, they were like, 
Uncle Charlie, how come you only eating those black olives? We got all this food here, and you only want black olives? And they asked him, you know, why, why black olives? And at 85 years old, he said, because it improves your sexual performance. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see the kids. <laughs> 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 they don't make them like they used to. But, but uh, I'm Uncle Charlie. So when he got back from the war, he became he became a bus driver. And as a bus driver, he pulled up the first day in Loudoun County, Virginia. He pulled up to the bus stop and opened the you know the door that folds back. And the kids at the bus stop were all white. And they looked and they saw a black man there. And they all, their eyes got big. And they all stopped. Uncle Charlie looked down at those kids, closed the door, and pulled off. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, when he pulled up, folded back the door, those kids got on the bus. And the, poor, the moral of that story is that progress waits for no one. You either get on the bus or you get left behind. So we have to move forward. And we need to, one of the legacies of our people on our bus is that we bring not only people who are like us, anyone who is in need. We don't just look out for our own, and I will argue right now, and I've argued many times, I believe that African people, particularly African American people, are the most moral, kind, good-hearted, inclusive people on the planet. I'll argue that. And that's not to say anything bad about anyone else. That's not to say anything bad about anyone else, or at least as moral as anyone on the planet. And that's why I think there is a concerted effort by our enemies to make us seem immoral and violent and all those other negative things that they portray us in the media. Because we are good people. We are kind people. So people ask me, why are you pro-immigrant when you're not an immigrant? Why are you pro-gay when you're not gay or transgender or anything like that? Why are you pro Latino or Asian or Asian American when you're none of those things? And my answer is because it's the right thing to do. And that's the, that's the legacy of our people. We stand for what's right. That's what we do. Now, the other thing, I know the theme for tonight is migrations, right? So I'm going to quickly tell you, you know, the story you know, my family, so my family started out, part of my family started out in the Caribbean, in, uh, in Barbados, and not too far, you know, from Sister Pat. And, you know, then went to Panama, where many Bayesians went to build a canal, and then to New York City. And they immigrated into a burning house here in the United States couldn't even get a sit-down meal in most cities as a black person. Now the other side of my family came from the deep south, came from South Carolina and Virginia. And I don't think I need to tell you people were struggling to take down a Confederate flag two years ago in South Carolina. And so we talk a lot of times, we talk about migrations we talk about people, migrants, coming from other countries. We also have to think about our ancestors here in this country when you're migrating and your country isn't your country. That's a lot of times what people forget when you are treated as though you are a stranger in your own house. And so what our ancestors did, and getting back to that theme of making your pain, your promise, is they work to make their, their, the lives of their progeny better 
than their own. They left, they got where they were going, and they left it better than when, it, when they found it. And that's what your role is here at the university as well. When you are a senior getting ready to graduate, think about that freshman kid who's trying to find his way. Embrace that kid. Mentor that kid. We all need mentors. And that's one of the things that we do. Of course, everyone knows the African proverb, each one teach one. So that's what we are, we need to do. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, I want to also give a shout out again. I know I already did it, but I'm going to give a shout out again to Dr. Z. And I'm going to give a shout out to Solomon because they are teachers. Are there any other, anybody in here who wants to be a teacher? Okay, one, two, beautiful, I love it. I would love it if there were more. But I want you to know, there's a, one of my favorite quotes. Liberate the minds of men, and ultimately you will liberate the bodies of men. I'll say that again, liberate the minds of men, and ultimately you will liberate the bodies of men. So you first have to, of course, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. I'm sure you heard that a little bit earlier. So you emancipate yourself, and then what is the legacy of our people here in this state? You emancipate yourself, and then you come back for your brothers and sisters. Harriet Tubman is from Maryland. She is the legacy that our people have in this country. You emancipate yourself, and you don't just run and leave everyone else behind. You go back and carry whoever you can. And that is who we are as a people. Now, lastly, I just want to say, I, I know I didn't go fully into it, but one of the things, the reasons I look up to, for those of you who don't know, who Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Divana are, they started an organization that they called STAR, and it was Street Transvestites uh, Action Revolutionaries. And they took all the pain of having to live on the streets. These were people who had to live on the streets, had to prostitute themselves, had to live terrible lives with deep depression and pain. And instead, and they were indigent in themselves, poor, they opened a shelter for LGBTQ youth. So they looked at their pain and they said, I don't want anyone else to feel the pain that I feel. And they opened a shelter, and by the way, just for your information, 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ. So that's an important point. And like I said, you can't be pro-black and be anti-LGBT. I don't accept that. You know, you can't be anti, you know, uh, any type of black people. All you can be is anti-anti-black if you're going to be pro-black. You know, two negatives make a positive. But other than that, you have to understand they took such painful lives that actually, like we said, we talk about Malcolm, we talk about Dr. King, and them losing their lives in the struggle. Marsha P. Johnson lost her life in the struggle, was murdered. But while she was alive, she took everything she could. She fought an early Black Lives Matter fight for black and Latino youth who were struggling on the streets being beaten up by police. Even more, you know, we know you can be targeted, and particularly at that time, be targeted by police just based on the fact that you're poor and black. But if you're poor, black, and trans, at a time before the word trans was around, they could kill you and no one would care. And so I think it's important for us to honor our unsung heroes. The people that we don't talk about every day. And the other, the last thing I want to leave you with, I said make your pain your promise, is you become a hero. 
you can become someone's hero. Annie Lane was so many people's hero besides mine, and I didn't even know it. And she died satisfied with that. She's in no history books. She's just etched in the memory of the people that she helped. And that was good enough for her. So all of you, I'm going to tell you right now, your pain is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to fix things. If you were walking down the street and you saw a pothole, and you twisted your ankle. Come back out there with that shovel and cover that pothole so no one else falls in it. That's the legacy of African people. And so lastly, I just wanted to say this one thing uh, because it's been stuck in my head and I want to get it out of my head. And it's a line from Lil Baby. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I'm going to leave it at that. Even though I do like that song. When we wake up, no key. Yeah. <laughs> all right, but I want to thank you all. I want to thank Ms. Carter for inviting me. Thank you so much. And let's have some food. Thank you.